and share my screen. Okay, let's start with a word of prayer. Thank you, Lord, that we can be gathered here and Lord, we are, as the psalmist says in Psalm 70, yet I am poor and needy. O oh Lord, have grace upon me. And we pray all of us are poor and needy in some way. And we ask for your illumination and help, God, and strengthen us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I um, want to say I appreciate your papers. Thank you all for the hard work you've put into them and for your thoughts. I appreciate your thinking and I read them with interest. I hope you won't mind. My wife says I'm way too uh, perfectionist in my correcting, but I've, uh, I have done all those kind of red marks to try to help you in the future. Just do a ch spell checks on them before you turn them in read them through again, maybe even read them through out loud to see where anything might be uh, not quite smooth and work them out. Take a lot of pride in what you're doing. I like your ideas. You can just <clears throat> sometimes make them a little flow a little more freely with good opening thesis statements. What do you want to show? What is it that you're trying to show so that all your ideas can work together in a, in a kind of a flow. And remember that uh, the end of the month isn't going to come up, uh, is going to come up pretty quickly. So start thinking about it. You know, and I have a sermon to write. I get a head start on it, a long time ahead. Start writing my ideas down, start writing, taking little notes, and then beginning to assemble your papers. So uh, that's my suggestion. But once again, thank you. If you are trouble finding, a topic for another research paper, just ask me and I'll, I'll be happy to help you. So uh, here we are today and right in the middle of the, <clears throat> the Middle Ages, we're in the Middle Ages, the Dark Ages, and the church is part of this, God's church, this church that you and I have inherited. We are the children of what went on in that period. We're the children of God, but <clears throat> there's so many lessons for us still to learn in this far off and remote time. <clears throat> so I hope that as we look at this today, that we can still be learning about how, how do we repeat the same errors today? How can we avoid uh, some of these errors, and how can we also take advantage of the good things that God does? What is God teaching us? You know, last week, uh, as we were going through this story of history, uh, we talked about how we're right in the middle of the Dark Ages, and um, all the decline that was going on, the assaults that were going on from without in Christendom, from, from the invasions of Vikings, of Saracens, these Muslims landing in their boats on the shores of France and Italy, and the Magyars, the Hungarians coming in from the east and spreading out through all the way down through Spain and Portugal. It's amazing the distance they traveled. There is God's precarious and fragile church in the midst of it, attempting to hang on. And they did, and God helped them from such individuals as King Alfred the Great, remember that name, a great name, King of Wessex in Southern England, who in his time escaped to marshes, uh, negotiated with the Danes, the Vikings, uh, sometimes beat them in battle and finally became King of all of England and introduced education again to the young people of his country. Anglo-Saxon boys and girls. He wanted them to learn about God and about uh, to get education. So 
we've talked about great men. Where might reform come and renewal in this dark ages now? Remember, we talked about how the papacy had gone, was, was, is, the word is a big word, N-A-D-I-R. I know I use big words, Nader, at its down point. This is the worst time for the church in Rome, for the papacy. So much violence and greed and uh, darkness going on as people try to gain a hold of this place where a uh, religious leader is ruling over papal states, over secular, great secular lands in the middle of Italy. So in the midst of all this, God raised up leaders like Alfred. Where else might we look for hope? Any ideas quickly? We're not going to spend a lot of time on this, but just uh, uh, where else? You don't have to know. Where would you work if you were God to help the church be renewed? Knowing what you know about the church in this time, it is not America. It's the dark ages. Where will hope be found? Well, I don't see a lot of hands up, so yeah, go ahead, Tim. Oh, it's Matt. Matt, where can help you found? The only two places I can think of is maybe from Britain, like someone tried to actually <coughs> help, but the only other thought I had was um, some of the more Nordic countries. Not, not, sorry, not Nordic countries. More like Denmark, that area, the German princes, because they had just been, the newness of faith, I was thinking, could have act, acted as a counter to the um, established nature of the papacy. Okay, uh, that's a very interesting thought, Matt. Uh, I hadn't thought of that, but, you know, there is some some good thoughts there. In other words, these new peoples coming to faith, the Danes, the Germanic people, maybe this will be a kind of a place of, of renewal in the church with no reference to the papacy. I think that's an interesting thought. And actually, the Germanic people who converted the next generation, there were some very great leaders among these Germanic people. It began to really, they took their, their faith seriously. Also this conversion, gradual conversion of these people did begin to limit some of their violence. Remember what happened to the Irish? Uh, they had been very violent, and the gospel took hold, and gradually, not only slavery stopped, but these people took their natural, I don't know if you'd call it aggression, but their natural inbuilt need to go out and conquer, and they began to conquer other lands through missionary work. They channeled their need to conquer in missionary work. So, yeah, I think there's hope to be found there. God's at work. In one particular area where God really began to work at this time as well was through monasteries. Uh, that's what I'd like to talk about now because these were these islands, even though the, the, the Vikings struck them again and again because they were places of wealth and their wealth was plundered. Oftentimes they were destroyed. Still, there were so many of these that some islands of spirituality and learning could still exist. Now you know why God created these. 
this was a call of God for that time. Is it a call today to go into monasteries? No, it isn't. But then it was, with all the violence and destruction, there was a place of peace, and learning, and evangelism. Um, however, as time went on, because it was the Dark Ages, a lot of these monasteries began to decline. And uh, royalty or aristocrats in the area would look at these monasteries, which were beginning to be more prosperous than other areas, and they'd say, that's a good place for my son to be, abbot. And so they would buy that position for their son or daughter as an abbess. And pretty soon kings were purchasing these things and aristocrats. And the rule of Benedict was more and more ignored. But some wanted truth. Truth is so important. Integrity, righteousness, godliness. Some wanted that. Now here is a word I'm going to try to say more often, but it's a good way to analyze the church in history. Write this down. There is the church of power and there is the church of piety. And that still exists today. The church of power and the church of piety. And many young men sought truth and righteousness in their lives and humility. Yeah, Matt. Um, in other classes, like um, Bible study methods and church theology, some of the books we're reading talk, have, or um, especially worship arts, uh, Introduction to Worship Arts with Dr. Pulse, one of the main themes that's in them is how a new church is being formed in opposition, not in opposition, but a new iteration of the old church. And this has happened multiple times in history. And this Cluniac reform seems to be one of them. Yes, absolutely. This is a movement of reform that comes from God's spirit, the church of piety. Anytime that a church or expression of it becomes a majority, it suddenly enters into the social kind of way things are. And people start taking true faith for granted. There's always a temptation. And so we get to the Cluniac reform and that is um, here. If you look at uh, Aquitaine, it's this orange area here, or pink or whatever, salmon-colored area. That was a huge area, Aquitaine. And uh, in this area, there was a man named William III, a very wealthy man, who founded on his lands a small monastery, just small. God's beginnings are usually small. He wanted as a head of this monastery, someone who respected the Benedictine rule. Remember, we looked at that a few weeks ago. So he appointed a monk as its head who was well known in the area for his piety, a, man, a monk named Berno. So this is a guy that was just known in the, in the area, but he was a guy who sought to live for God in a pious way. His name was Berno. And, and he said, I'd like you to start a monastery and Berno, asked Williams for some of the best of his land, the land that William liked to use for, for hunting. And uh, uh, du the Duke, William, said okay. And he gave up something important to him so he could start this monastery. 
and he deeded this, he did something kind of clever. He knew what Rome was like, and he knew what the people around him were like. And so he didn't deed this to the church hierarchy in the area. He founded this monastery and deeded it to the saints, Peter and Paul themselves, whatever that means. But what it does mean is that it was under the jurisdiction of Rome, so local bishops and archbishops couldn't appoint their own people to it and corrupt it. Nor could dukes or princes. And uh, the reason he did that was because if this monastery starts to be well run, it'll start to prosper and people will look at it with covetous eyes. So he put it directly under the authority of the Pope. But he, he also knew the Pope wasn't guy to be trusted. So part of the deed was he explicitly forbade the Pope from invading or otherwise taking what belonged only to the two holy apostles, Peter and Paul. So it was kind of independent of everybody. So he kept, kept it out of the Pope's greedy hands. Uh, was someone trying to say something there? Yeah. Basically said, this is the Peter and Paul, and only Peter and Paul. Let's you stay out of this. Yeah, yeah, Pope stay out of this. And anybody else. And so uh, he was, he knew the central temptation. was money and power. And if that sounds familiar, let your hearts be open to this message of Jesus. God cannot, you, a man, you cannot serve God and mammon. It doesn't mean that God doesn't want to help us. It does not mean that. And sometimes he can give certain individuals wealth but guard your heart above all things, says the Proverbs. For out of it is the source of life. And he knew the temptation for all of us is mammon and power. But I, in Psalm 70, says, am poor and needy. O oh Lord. Come quickly to me, O oh God, you are my help and my deliverer, says that song. Always to maintain a position of humility. That's one of the keys of the Benedictine rule. One of the keys, humility, humility, humility at all times. So that the abbot himself is serving the others and all work together as brothers and sisters. So Bernal headed this Clooney monastery for some 17 years. And during that time, founded other monasteries with the same piety. Bernal's successors were for the next 225 years, with one brief exception, very pious and godly individuals. And they started out of this little beginning a spiritual reformation among monasteries in the whole of Western Europe. One after another, they, people sat up and said, yes, that's what we want. We want to live godly, humble lives devoted to Christ. So they kept the rule of Benedict and in doing so reformed hundreds of other monastic houses too. Now they don't just set up their own, but they reformed hundreds through their example and through the people they sent out. And they began, there began to be a reform movement in women's houses as well under an abbess named Marcigny. I tried to find a picture of her on the internet, couldn't do it. Marcigny was too discreet, apparently. And she was a very powerful woman, abbess, who also helped reform women's monasteries. So everywhere, monasteries began to improve so that people looked up in awe. It was God's work. It reminded them 
reminds me of the revivals that swept America in the 18th, 19th century. I'm looking forward to telling you about those. And in Great Britain, an outpouring of God's spirit that affected entire peoples and nations. Those outpourings were, and this is the way he worked in the Middle Ages. Yes, God was there. God didn't start working when the evangelical church came on the scene in America or in Great Britain. He's been at work at the church wherever it is in the world, drawing men and women to him. Jesus said, whoever looks on the son and believes on him has eternal life. And people look to the son, Christ, and they believed. So many people and monks were coming to church now that new churches needed to be built. And because the Vikings had so quickly burned these churches, they had thatched roofs or wooden roofs, they changed the style and began to form masonry roofs. And this was the beginning of Romanesque churches. I love these churches. When you, if you ever go to France, then visit these Romanesque churches from the 10th, 11th, and 12th centuries. They're beautiful in their simplicity, and they're not overly huge like Gothic churches are. Some people like Gothic. I like Romanesque. Gothic came later. These churches are beautiful, and they're everywhere. So many churches that were built that people talked about France being white with churches, and many were built when many, many more were built in Spain and Portugal and in Germany. Um, people were coming to church and monks were filling them. And they kept building monasteries. Here's uh, some pictures of monasteries of the period. This is what they look like. Doesn't that look like a place of peace? And those are uh, the walkways that the people could walk and pray uh, when it was bad weather. It's the inside under those arches. And then in the other side are the rooms where monks lived or where the kitchens were or meeting halls, prayers were, or the places where they copied scrolls. So monks, monasteries were being built. Uh, Cluniac monks, these are the monks of Cluny. Did I show you? Yeah, Cluny, that first picture that I showed you here, Aquitaine is where Cluny was, and there's now what Cluny Monastery looks like. Of course, it didn't look like that at the time. Um, they divided, they spent nearly all their time in prayer divine offices, reciting scripture and prayer. At their height, they were singing 138 songs in a single day. But when time, the elaborate worship services began to take the upper hand and work in the fields was replaced by prayer and singing while local peasants worked the land. So it began just to be more and more elaborate in their worship services. So this lack of corruption, careful accounting, count keeping, and hard work brought wealth in its turn. People, neighboring nobilities would say, what do I do with my wealth when they die? They wanted to make right things with God and they would give grant lands to these monasteries. So the monasteries began to have huge tracts of land that were attached to them. And this time wealth was added to wealth. And this began to undermine their principles again. So that young people with idealism and fervor were turning to new renewal movements that rose up to take place of the Cluniac monasteries. And one of those that we're gonna talk about for a minute is called the Cistercian monastic movement. It starts here in Cito, a place in France. You see this dark green near the top of it, where it was, is where, where Cito was. That doesn't, that, that's where, anywhere, where this began. And it was also another a man named Robert of Molen who founded this new monastery, monastery 
Uh, and it was an attempt to, once again, to put the rule of St. Benedict into practice. And this is what the historian Paul Johnson has to say about it. The Cistercians placed their monasteries far away from towns and hence from temptations. They cleared huge tracts of land for agriculture. The Cistercians thus became the agricultural apostles of Europe's internal colonization. They worked on a vast scale and with terrific organization and panache. Most of them were aristocrats, the younger sons of magnates. They saw themselves as a small, pure elite. Their discipline was ferocious. They developed great driving force, became outstanding managers and prospered enormously. Their 12th century expansion, that's the 1100s, is an economic phenomenon, almost without parallel in history. The first house was founded in 1908, or I'm sorry, 1098, 1098. 20 years later, there were seven houses. By 1152, there were 328. And by the end of the century, 525, that is, after only 100 years, they had founded 525 monastic houses in areas far from towns, clearing out the forests and providing agricultural lands. By this means, Paul continues, or Johnson, in just a century, a huge addition was made to the available resources of Europe, chiefly in Spain and Portugal, Hungary, Poland, Sweden, and Austria, Wales, Northern England, and the Scottish border. One monastery, Golden Cron in Bohemia, covered nearly 1,000 square miles. And its agricultural exploitation involved the creation of 70 villages. They profited from the increase in population by creating lay brothers from the poor who were treated like monks, had no wives and children, tilled the land and were promised salvation. They outnumbered the Cistercian monks themselves by three to four. So, so many lay brothers came and began to be attached to these, working the lands, that it was huge. I just want you to think about this for a minute. Think about Europe, assaulted by Vikings and Saracens and Magyars, with huge forests that are un, uncut. Bandits hanging in the forest. So anytime you go through in the Dark Ages, there's somebody pouncing on you. You stay in your village. And here are the Cistercians working the land and developing it and making Europe into what it is today. These were Christians doing this, my friends. Now, what will happen to a nation? Think about this. Where the leadership doesn't care. Why is clearing land and producing agriculture so important. Any kind of brief ideas about this? Why is this important? How is this important? Go ahead, Tim. I thought it was time we heard from you. You're up next, Mariana, so be thinking about this. So it's not exactly an answer to your question, but I couldn't stop thinking about how they're sounding more and more like uh, like kings and serfs at this point. It sounds like they're, they're turning from working the land themselves and turning more into the people working the land for them and it's more like their own little kingdoms. Okay, I, um, 
I can see that in the Clooney movement as time went on, but these Cistercians were taking very seriously the Benedictine rule, which meant so many times hours a year, they needed to work the fields and do labor. <clears throat> and I believe they were working, and particularly when they founded their monasteries, they did the work themselves. They cleared the fields, they cleared the, the woods and forests and done it, did it. They were hardworking men, even though they were from the aristocratic background. So our aristocrat doesn't think he has to work, but these guys did. They showed their humility by working in this way. Am I? I got a little bit mixed up then. What's that? And I got a little bit mixed up then. And the lay people were attracted to this and they said, we want, we want to help too. We want to do this. We want to take vows. We want to not go on completely because we want to stay. We might have our own property. I don't know how that worked, but why they didn't actually become monks themselves. But uh, there were lay people that just were drawn to this. Is that, am I following you tracking, Tim? Okay. What are your thoughts, Mariana? Um, the question that you asked was, why is clearing up uh, the, oh, I think I messed up what I wrote down. What was the question again, clear? Yeah, it's maybe not completely clear. Why is this? Emphasis on agriculture, clearing land, hard work. Um, maybe to make a point and just leave something behind. And leave something behind. I, I don't know. Yes. And what I don't know if that's something that. <laughs> yeah, what did it leave behind? Well, for other people to see what they built or something like that. I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm. It was a lousy question, Mariana, so don't worry. <laughs> it's kind of a segue into something I want to say right now, but look at this. Here are the Cistercian monasteries. You see that on the, <clears throat> on the PowerPoint there. Mm -hmm. Cistercian and Cluny monasteries. Look what was happening in the European continent. Everywhere they went, they were clearing land and woods and farming. This is where European prosperity came from. And the guys who did it were devoted not to their own wealth, but to God. And work was a part of it. In their humility, they did it. And that other screen is... Uh, ruins of one of the Cistercian monasteries. Look what they built, beauty at the same time. Now think what's happening in Russia today. I just read an article about that. It has the largest land area of any country on earth. But it has an economy the size of Spain. It has three times as many people as Spain. And yet its economy is the same size. Half of its arable land, the land that was tilled under communism, is now gone to seed. Farmers are forsaking the land so quickly that soon there's going to be very little that's left because people in the cities earn twice as much as people on land. There is something that's called a, a toxic hogweed that is invading Russia. It originally was planted around because they thought they could use it as biomass. It's like nine, 10 feet tall. It's so toxic, you see that little hand, it's all swollen it, and that little boy's face, you touch it, and it causes burning.
And the leaders of the country don't care. Why? Because they're not public servants. Christianity brought the notion that people who are in leadership should be servants. Servants to their country. And that's what we call them, public servants. In Russia, people are have positions of leadership and power so they can make themselves wealthy. That's all they care about. So roads and public infrastructure is not being created in Russia. Farmers are impoverished. Their roads are not being built. Only 1% of the agricultural companies get nearly all the money. And those companies make it rich. That country, that huge country today is close to turning its country back into a wilderness. What happens when the leaders of our country and those are at its base as well, forsake pursuing God and make wealth their main objective. The same thing could happen in any country is happening to Russia if we don't make integrity, righteousness, honesty, love, goodness, kindness, peacemaking our goal as and the, and the Beatitudes and all that Paul talks about. So anyway, that was a little excursus. And uh, thank you for listening to my preaching. I don't get enough chance to do it in my church, so I do it with you, see. So one of the great figures of the Cistercian movement was a man named Bernard of Clairvaux. You'll have to hear his name was 23 years of age when he presented himself at Cito in about the year 112 in the company of several relatives and friends and requested admission to the community. He was a man of immense oratorical powers and huge authority all over Europe. He had more authority than the Pope. Soon, those he convinced to join him were so numerous at Cito that he founded a new community at Clairvaux, and this in turn became, like Cluny, the center of a new European renewal and reform of the church. His speaking was such that people referred to him as Dr. Mellifluous. That means something like honey mouth. His personality dominated his times. Kings were afraid of him. Henry II of England and Aquitaine was afraid of him. As a mystic, he meditated deeply on the humanity of Jesus. He wrote many, many hymns and poems. Here's one we still sing today. I don't know if any of you know this hymn. Raise your hand if you've heard it. Jesus, the very thought of thee with sweetness fills my breast, but sweeter far thy face to see and in thy presence rest. Nor voice can sing, nor heart can frame, nor can the memory find a sweeter sound than thy blessed name, O Savior of mankind. O ever hope of every contrite heart, O joy of all the meek, to those who fall, how kind thou art, how good to those who seek. But what to those who find? Ah, this. Nor tongue can, nor pen can know. The love of Jesus, what it is only his loved ones know. Jesus, my only joy be thou, as thou my prize shall be. Jesus, be thou my glory now and for eternity. I read that just because I want you to know that even though I'm not a Catholic, we're Catholic, and we can find many things to criticize, and we will in the next few sessions as we look at the reform, there were still godly people. God had not abandoned his church. And we are heirs of the spirituality that was there. This is our church too. It is our church too. I keep wanting to ask you these questions, but then I look at the ones I've prepared and I think, you know, here's one. 
Why didn't God use Protestant means to do renewal? Just put the Bible into everyone's hands and have self-ruled churches. Why didn't God do that? What do you think, Grace? Um, I think maybe because it wasn't time, like they weren't ready for that, just in the terms of like the conditions that people had been living in and um, just where they were at uh, in the church. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. The times that God was, that those people were living in, that couldn't work. So God worked with that. He worked with that. Yeah, Matt, you had something to say or do you wanna? Thank you, Grace. Another possible reason is um, there was a possibility of what has happened nowadays, the splintering of the church into different denominations, which uh, Paul in 1 Corinthians warned about. And God may have not done that because especially at that time, it, if that had happened, it would have degenerated into mass warfare within mass warfare of all the countries and all against each other at the same time. That's an interesting comment too, Matt. And that is that when religious revival starts, if they are not in the same church, they're in different kind of denominations, that can create war. And it did in time to come. So God was in a sense protecting the church. Yeah, Tim? So I also think that it's, it's, it's also showing, it's, it's God showing us one side of things because uh, when you look at the world it's very rare that something isn't as good when it's balanced compared to when it's on one side or the other so this is showing the downfalls of centralized authority and all of the things that the catholic system entails and nowadays we're starting to experience all of the things that a more like not said fractured system entails all the downsides of people being free to rule their own churches pretty much. And I'm, I'm believing that eventually God will bring us to that balance point in the middle. Mm, yeah, so there are upsides and downsides to every system. And we have our own downsides today. Finding balance is going, always going to be elusive until Christ comes back. There is no perfect system. We just need to keep working at it with the grace that God gives us. Um, it is something that we have such a grace God that he adapts to cultures in ways befitting those cultures. In some ways he respects our belief systems and loves us where we are. And that includes each of you students. Do any of you have a perfect belief system out there? I don't. No. Yeah, Matt. Just notice something. Um, Bernardo. Come a little closer. Come a little closer. So, um, clairvoyant. Is, is this where the term clairvoyant came from? Since you mentioned that Bernard was a mystic. Um, when he meant mystic, who often meditated on the personhood of Jesus. Do you, do you know if that's where the term clairvoyant came from? No. Okay. I was just oh. like, that's Claire, odd. I, I, yeah, that it does sound, yeah, it is a similar term, but that's not what the, uh, yeah, a vow in French is, uh, is a hill. And uh, Claire is clear, as you guessed. Voyant, clairvoyant, clairvoyant means to see clearly. And uh, uh, this was a place, Clairvaux, but that's not where clairvoyant came from. Yeah, thank you, but a good, uh, a good thought. He was a mystic, but just because, but when I talk about mystic, 
Well, there's Christian mysticism and asceticism, and then there's a kind of a mysticism that is wrong, spiritual, spirituality that is not of God. And uh, uh, it can be a little bit difficult to, de to describe, but uh, I think that's, there is, there are dangers and we have to keep our hearts rooted in the scriptures. I think that's really, really important. And uh, Bernard of Clairvaux wasn't a perfect man. If you study his life, he made some big mistakes. And I think one of them was preaching the third crusade, but then again, he had reasons to do that too. So let's, uh, let's go on. Uh, I think we got about a half hour. I'd like to look at something um, Another fruit of this uh, of this revival. Um, we talked about Bernard of Clairvaux. We talked about Berno of Cluny, and uh, at in the mid eleventh century, these Cluniac monks set themselves to reforming the highest offices of the church itself. Remember, we talked about all the violence going on there in Greed, and it was really sad what was going on in Rome. And these three guys got together. Hildebrand was German. Bruno was of, uh, Bruno was of Toul in France. And Humbert, I don't know where he came from, but these three got together and they traveled to Rome in the late 1840s. And uh, Bruno had such a reputation that the German Emperor Clement wished to appoint Bruno Pope. Well, this is what an emperor could do in those days, apparently. But Bruno refused unless chosen by the people of Rome himself. Here we are, remember? Uh, this isn't the first time this has happened. It happened to Gregory the Great. It happened to Anselm. Um, not Anselm, but, um, mm, oh well, uh, popes chosen by acclamation or mayors chosen by acclamation and so forth. And people, the people of Rome chose Bruno to be their pope. And 1049, he became Louis the 14th. There is uh, some artist's depiction of him. And he was a great pope, although he only ruled for five years. He had, his rule had tremendous consequences for the church. For one, he took on the task of reforming it. Another reason his rule was important was because it was during his reign or rule that the Eastern Orthodox Church split from Rome. We'll talk about that in a minute. So what did the reforms consist of? First is Leo took pains to withdraw the church from the control of secular and aristocratic powers and from simony. Anybody know the term simony? There is a picture of it right there. It comes from the Bible, Acts 18, 8, 18 to 19, when Simon Magus attempted to buy the power of Peter to lay on his hands so that people could receive the gift of the Spirit, Holy Spirit. He tried to buy it, Simon Magus. And so that term simony came about. That's buying ecclesiastical offices, bishoprics, whatnot, with month, just buying it for your son, for your daughter. Um, he attempted to stop this. And just think about what happens to an institution. When something which is meant for good and is noted for its piety and honor and hospitality and integrity and care of the poor and humble labor becomes somewhere where a rich nobleman just buys a post for his son who doesn't care anything about those things. 
what happens to the whole institution underneath him? The whole thing degrades. Rules aren't kept, nobody cares. If you have someone who does not respect that, deepest and truest and goodest things at the top, then the whole body will become infected. And so Louis or Leo, Leo IX attempted to eliminate anything. Another reform, one we good Protestants would not like was Leo's insistence upon clerical celibacy. That is the requirement that clergy, clergy monks or priests mostly could not marry. This had been a tendency in the Roman church in earlier centuries, but during the time of Augustine, and during the time of, uh, of Augustine, but, and that's, you know, around the year 400, but after the fall of Rome to barbarians, the custom had fallen into disuse. In fact, there had never been a universal rule concerning clerical celibacy. Parish priests and bishops were often married all the way up to the time of the Reformation, you'd find priests with concubines. They wouldn't officially be married, but they'd have children and they would just have to pay a little a fine for their children. But in this point, Leo IX is trying to get it forbidden of priests. So why would they do this? What problem do you think he was trying to cure? Let's say that he's just kind of thinking about it from a really good point of view. What's he trying to cure or to, to stop? What abuse is he trying to stop by having priests single? What do you think, Liz? What do you think, Liz? You, I know you're there. I can't see you, but you're behind there. You think you can get away with it, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> um. I think that you said that many of these uh, ministers, I guess if you could use that word, had concubines, which means they had more than one wife or um, not wife, but more than one, what would you say? Partner. partner, there you go. So having more than one partner would mean having a lot of kids and i don't know i think that would be troublesome um there would be no stability in the kids uh lives and just raising a family is a huge responsibility so i think one he was trying to look out for the church and how their relationships with their partners were being handled and um, he just, I think he just wanted them to, to protect themselves and really just focus on ministry instead of causing all this. I don't know, it, it, it just sounds really responsible to have a lot of. Yes, and I, um, there might be a misunderstanding here, Liz, about the term celibacy. Celibacy means not being married at all. Mm -hmm. was, he was requiring priests not to marry at all. It wasn't a question of having more than one partner. It just meant don't marry. He was trying to enforce that and he was trying to clean up, clear up an abuse that was going on. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you're right too. He wants them to vote their time just to God. But there is something else that he was trying to uh, solve a problem. Yeah, Tim. I'm not sure Liz was thinking about this, but she didn't really mention it. Uh, it's also sexual immorality, what you were saying about concubines. And they, well, I mean, like you, that's a leader of the church right there. That's the person that's in Catholicism you're confessing your sins to. And, oh, but he has several women that he sleeps with and a ton of illegitimate children. That's not great. <laughs> it's not a good example. And it's especially not a good thing for some of the church. And I remember I was thinking about whether I should be a, like go for being a pastor or not. 
And one of the things that I was told is the most important thing is that you're living a righteous life. It's not necessarily about education or any of that, although that's important. It's the most important thing is to be godly. And if you have men like that who aren't being godly, that's not good. Yeah. And also, since uh, since we were talking about the celibacy thing, that also might be dissuading people with, you know, sexual issues from going into the priesthood. And I'm not entirely sure what the abuse is about, but I, I'm happy to learn about it. Um, a good point. You know, maybe make this pop. You really want to serve God, then if you got sexual needs, Mary, don't become a priest. Uh, my kind of pushback to all that is, you know, doesn't Paul say if you have, it's better to marry than to burn. And there's a lot of burning going on in these, in the priesthood. So, and as a result of that, a lot of abuse, why not just marry? Uh, and that's what the reformers said. Uh, but he is trying to, he is trying to say, okay, I want you guys to be an ideal to be righteous if you're priests. But there is one you probably wouldn't guess. And that is that if you're living in a wild and woolly kind of area and you're a priest and you have children. Well, being a pastor a priest means you've got some security. People's donations are coming in. You've got a post, a job. Why not just hand this down to my son afterwards? And pretty soon, that local parish priest's family is dominating religion in that area just through heredity and the church belongs to the family not to the community um, and that was a problem monasteries weren't that way they didn't marry in monasteries so that could pass on from one kind of committed group to another but the parish priests were marrying so what happens at that point? Does this just become a family concern afterwards? And this Pope Leo wanted to stop it. Handing on, there's a word for that, and I keep forgetting it now. Suddenly it's, uh, when you give over something, you protect your own family uh, in this kind of way and it just becomes father, son, grandson, great grandson, and so forth. And they are more or less own the church afterwards. So that's what he was trying to clean up. And uh, I appreciate your thinking about this because a lot of the things that you said are true. And it is, but it does make you wonder, particularly when we get to the reform, why these things occurred as they did. Tim, Tim, yeah. Uh, nepotism that you were looking for? Word? Nepotism, yes, thank you. I don't know why I can't remember that word. Thank you. Nepotism. Exactly. Good word. Good word. Nepotism. The third thing that these guys did was to forbid the appointment to office of bishops and abbots by kings, nobles, and dukes. These bishops were to be appointed by church superiors only and then validated, validated by the Pope. The church was to be independent of secular authority. That is really key in understanding this period. You know, how intermixed religion and church and state was. Because these were the educated people. It wasn't, you only have freedom of religion, everyone believes what they want, you know, whatever. These clerical, these clerics, these people who were monks and priests and stuff, these were the educated people. They were used in court, in court to keep the church 
or keep the, the state records and whatever. Not only that, but when people were baptized, that's where the records of the church were. The, rec the church kept the records of baptism and naming people and uh, so many things that had to do with taxes and so forth. So what the Pope is saying is, we don't want our bishops appointed by the king. Really important issue as time goes on. And it makes you ask the question again, how independent of secular authorities should the church be? Where do you draw the line? Where do you draw the line between what a government says and what a church says? It's not quite as clear as we might think, particularly day when everyone considered themselves Christian. Everyone is baptized in the church as an infant. This is Christendom. Where do you draw the line? Henry II of England complained about murders and theft by priests and monks that were not persecuted because they would simply come to the church authorities. The church authorities would forgive them and they'd say, well, you know, they're monks. They're priests, therefore they're under our authority and the king, you can't do anything about it. What a dilemma. Today we have such clarity, division, separation of church and state, but getting there, what a process. And how do you define what a government should legislate on and what a church should legislate or say is right and true. What's the relationship between those two? Anyway, obedience to the Pope by the entire church was emphasized at this time. And it was this last conviction that Leo IX had that created the schism between the Eastern Orthodox Church in Constantinople and the church in Rome. What is the authority of the Pope? Is his authority over the entire world, over the church everywhere? Here's the deal. And we're going to run out of time. I know we are. Remember the Norman Vikings came down and conquered southern Italy, and they set up what is called this Kingdom of Sicily. Uh, this 1154 is a little later on. They're, at this point, they're still, like, apparently are still in Sic Sicily or something like that. But uh, so This Norman kingdom of Sicily in southern Italy covered lands that had up to this point belonged to the Byzantines back in Constantinople. What happened there? Let's see. And uh, so the Byzantines were happy about this. Their lands had been taken over by Norman Vikings who'd set up their own kingdom. These Vikings had become Christians now, these Normans. And the Byzantines said, hey, Leo, these people are Christians. Tell them to get out of our lands. They should obey your authority. And so Leo said, okay, I'll talk to them. And Leo went down and talked to them and they said, no way. We're not leaving here, we like it here. This is a great place to be. Visit Sicily sometime in Southern Italy and you'll see why, lovely. The Vikings say, we like this a lot better than back in Denmark or in Norway. So." They decided to set up their kingdom and stay there. So the Pope said, yeah, well, he got some Swabian army together to help him. And they decided to move down to attack and force the Normans out of their kingdom. The Normans pled with him not to fight with him. 
They said, you are a spiritual authority. We don't want to go to war with you. Please don't do it. But he did anyway. And in 1053, he was roundly defeated by the Normans, Leo IX was, and held captive by them for nine months, though he was well treated. Um, he was kept there until he recognized their rights to the lands that they had conquered in Southern Italy. And this led to negotiations with Constantinople, with the Byzantines. The Normans wanted permanent residence there. And so the Pope, eager to get out of jail, sent away a legate uh, or an ambassador of his to talk to Constantinople so that they would give up their lands to these Normans. He said, I have authority over you to command you to do this. And they said, what? What authority? He said, the donation of Constantine. And he pulled out a document that was purported to have been written at the time of Constantine in some 700 years before. In fact, it probably had been forged 230, two or 300 years before. It was a forgery and it was proved during the Renaissance it was a forgery in which Constantine had said to the Pope or to the, the leader of Rome at the time, I give you authority over the whole church. Over all, the, over all the other bishops of Antioch and Egypt and Constantinople, wherever I have given, in Carthage, I've given you authority over the whole church. That was called the Donation of Constantine. And that you, as the successor of Peter, have the authority over all. It's doubtful that Leo IX knew this was a forgery or even the, his, his uh, ambassador Humber Humbert, one of the three guys that had originally gone to Rome. Um, but needless to say, the Byzantines looked in this say, and they said, no way, this is not true. They refused to accept it. So Cardinal Humbert, who believed it real, excommunicated the Patriarch of Constantinople. And the Patriarch of Constantinople responded in kind and excommunicated the Catholic Church. So now we had, in effect, two churches that have excommunicated each other. One was the Greek-speaking church, the Eastern Orthodox, and the other was the Latin-speaking church of Western Europe, which was the Roman Catholic Church. And that year was 1040. Five. And that's how those two churches split. 1054, rather. Important date. Now we have East Orthodox and we have Roman Catholic. Although we'll get to the end of the course, there was also the Syriac Church, which was a historian church, and there were the Coptics in Egypt. But we have two different uh, churches. Uh, Louis IX died a few minutes after he was released by the Normans. A few months later he died. I believe he was bludgeoned to death. Five years later another pope came on the throne, Pope Nicholas II, and he called something called a Lateran Council. There were many Lateran Councils. This is the Lateran Palace. This is where the Pope lives. And he comes and speaks from his balcony and so forth. And he had a whole meeting of cardinals that came together. And they decided together that from here on, all cardinals, the Pope would choose the cardinals. The Pope would. That meant that if you have a good Pope, He's going to choose upright, reform-minded, renewal-minded men. The Pope begins to have huge, huge authority. And unfortunately, I don't think we're going to be able to finish this. 
Uh, this man, Hildebrand, one of the three, also became Pope Gregory VII, and there was a huge issue between him and the Holy Roman Emperor, who refused to recognize the Pope's right to appoint his own bishops. And the Pope had such authority now throughout Europe that he said, well, Henry IV gathered together his own bishops and they decided to excommunicate the Pope. But the Pope said, nuts to you. And he put the whole of the Holy Roman Empire under interdict. That meant to say that nothing worked for them. Their baptism, their communion, nothing else worked. And pretty soon his whole empire was up in arms against, not up in arms, but they refused to accept his, his authority, the emperor's authority any longer. No one was obeying him. And this is called the investiture conflict in which, it, in which who has authority, the Pope or the King? Who has the authority to appoint bishops, to appoint bishops? And finally, um, I, I'm running out of time here, but uh, the Pope, uh, finally, uh, here's a picture of it. The emperor came and knelt in the snow. He went, he came to Canosa. That's this area here in Italy where the Pope was residing at the time. It was a strongly fortified place. And he knelt in front of the Pope's door for three days in the snow until the Pope would finally forgive him and restore his authority. And only then could this emperor, Henry IV, return to Germany and to he had to put down some rebellions that were taking place now. And he confessed that the Pope was his authority. This wasn't the end of their conflict, but um, it was uh, just to show you here how the papacy grew in power during this period and began to exercise huge power over kings and the Holy Roman emperors not time to go into it, but 1066, the invasion of the Normans of England. The only reason that they won was because the Pope excommunicated the King of England at the time. And he was so struck by this and the whole church in England that after the Battle of Hastings, when he lost, London just opened its doors and one place after another opened its doors and all of the French mercenaries that came in with William the Conqueror just took over an otherwise peaceful place and ended up killing a third of the people so that they could have power. This is an unwanted uh, result of papal power. Pope didn't know what was going to happen. He would have regretted if he knew. But that's the result. There is no, no embedded question today. Couldn't think of any. You're safe. You don't have to worry about it. Um, I had brought this question out. Just think about it. Look at 1 Corinthians 5, 3 to 5, Paul handed a sinful member of the church over to Satan. Can the church as a whole do this today? Can we do this? The Pope was trying to and felt he had that authority. Goodness. What's God's will for us? Help us to exercise, O oh Lord, our authority with humility and love humility and love, and the power we receive by living righteous lives and the respect that we have. People look up to us. May God help us not to misuse it.
So thank you for coming today. Thank you for listening. I know this was a lot of lecture, but it's important stuff to know what was going on in the church in the Middle Ages, how the, the church cardinals and the Pope gained their authority, why there was celibacy, and to know that at one time, things weren't the same. So bless you. We'll see you Thursday. Bye now. Thank you.